Good evening, everybody. Kabot Haraf, how are you? Thank God. Good evening. Okay. So our friend uh, Yonatan, he asked us a question. I, he left a message on my WhatsApp. The question was like this, how do you know if something is mezonot or hamotzi, what do you make on some, you know, some kind of bread, whatever, cake? How do you know if you make hamotzi or mezonot? This is the question that he asked. So the, the basic answer is like this, right? That if it's if it's made from meals, you know, to have meals with it, so then it's hamotzi. If it's made as a dessert or a snack, then it's mezonot, you know? So in other words, the question is, what do most people eat, eat, eat it as? Do they eat it as a meal or do they eat it as a dessert or a snack? This is the, this is the way you decide if it's hamotzi or mezonot. But there's different opinions about uh, this, uh, you know, there's different issues there involved. But basically that's the idea. So there are some, you know, foods which are like very borderline. You know, like uh, sometimes you eat it as a snack, sometimes you eat it as a meal. Like matzot, for instance, you know, or, or pizza, you know, also some people have questions about pizza as well. But the truth is that if you go according to the rules, it's pretty clear, you know, that both matzot and pizza, they should be hamotzi because you, you, you make meals with them. There's also about a question about um, about sweet halot, you know. So the Ashkenazim they make hamotzi, and the Sfarim, you know, most of them, whatever, they make mezonot. But the truth is, if you look at it carefully, I think the better idea is to make hamotzi on that because today people use them, use them as a meal. They use they eat them as a meal. There's different ways to approach it. There's a story one time, you know, I heard that, uh, you know, Robert Shlomo Zolman Eurbach, you know, who was one of the big poskim of the generation. So he went to a certain wedding, or whatever, somewhere, somebody invited him. And uh, so what happened was that uh, the guy gets up, you know, uh, the one who's making the, the, the party and, you know, gets on the microphone and tells people, you know, all the bread is mezonot over here, you know, make mezonot on it. So somebody didn't like this, you know, whatever. So he tells the rabbi there, tells him, he says, just come on, this is a joke. How can you make mezanot uh, on this bread? You know, you're having such a big meal like this, blah, blah, blah. So Rashomu Zalman Orbach told him, he said, he said, it's not so simple. He said, just, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to fight about it. Leave it alone. Let them do what they're doing. So he felt that, uh, you know, there was what to rely on on both sides. Whether you make mezanot on it or whether you come out mozi, whatever. Okay, so getting back to our discussion.
So, um, looks like we're on head. Yeah, the last one. One last one here. So let's get started. So it says a bit Yosef, uh, quotes from the tour that we read yesterday. So it says, uh, if he read in a place where there's a doubt, uh, you know, if there's excrement there or not, that was a question that we had there. Uh, so it says, Bet Yosef, where's the source of this? Perk Misha It's over there in Brachot, Chav Bet Amud Bet. Tan Rabbanan, it says there, right? The rabbis taught, <clears throat> so he says if a person um, prayed in a certain place and then they found afterwards excrement there so he says even though he sinned by praying there but his prayer is a prayer he doesn't have to pray again Amar Abba says Rabba uh, hi uh, so Rabbi says, no, this is not accepted, this prayer, you know, because it's, uh, this person is wicked. He's not doing the proper thing by praying in the place of excrement. So it says the Rosh, it seems like in this Gemara, we're talking about a place where there's a doubt whether there's excrement there or not. But it's Lot Sheesham Tsua. So in other words, there is it's the kind of a place where you know you wouldn't be too surprised to find it there. You know it, uh, it wouldn't be a big shock for you. So therefore this is the reason why it says the uh, Rava that uh, he sent this person, you know uh, and therefore, it's not accepted. His uh, his uh, his his uh, reading there, whatever the, the, the prayer. So the question is, what was his sin, right? So the answer is, is because he should have checked. You know, since it's a kind of a place where excrement could be there, it's very possible. So he should have checked. Uh, he looked around a little bit, whatever, and seen what's going on there. Since he didn't check, you know, he was like negligent. So this is the reason why uh, the uh, Rava said, right, that uh, his prayer is not accepted. Okay, good. So uh, goes on like this. Abba. But it says, if it wasn't a place where there's any doubts there, then it wouldn't be called wouldn't be called uh, right something uh, the offering of the wicked. What? Why? 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 Why wicked? He didn't do anything wrong. This guy. He did. He, he did. He didn't. He didn't need to check there. The, the, there was. He wasn't expected there. So therefore, this is the reason why. Uh, right. Uh, the Rosh says that it must be talking about a place where it was suspected to be there. Okay. Good. So then he says right. Uh, so therefore, right, if he prayed, his prayer would be okay. But the Avad, you don't have to go back and pray again if that would be the case. That's what it says on Tosot. also. Rashba, So it says, even though this halacha was talking about prayers, same thing for Kiachima, right? It's, a, it's the same criterion, basically. So, therefore, right, uh, uh, it's interchangeable, basically. Okay, so. Uh, this perk over there. Ahad de Aminan. 
That, that which we said, shikor alit palen. We said, right, in the Gemara, that um, a person who's drunk shouldn't pray the Amidah. And if he did pray, it's not accepted his, his prayer, right? It's an abomination. Okay. So it says we need to examine this a little bit. The question is should we say that filah, the prayers and blessings, have the same halacha? When it comes to excrement, the shikor, and also when it comes to drunkenness. So he says, you have to say that they're not really the same thing, uh, these things. They're not the same halacha. What does that mean? So what does that mean? Somebody who's shatui. What is shatui? Shatui means that he drank, but he's not really drunk. You know, he's just a little bit inebriated, right? The, had like you know one or two drinks whatever something like that he's not slashed but he's inebriated a little bit so he shouldn't pray because he should wait till his head calms down right and he you know he sobers up uh but but if he prayed it uh it's it's accepted because it's, he's not that drunk Ah, but it says when it comes to Birkat Hamazon, right, somebody who, who's you know inebriated can can even lechatchila say Birkat Hamazon. So you see from there that blessings and tefillah are not the same thing. Uh, all all the blessings are the same as Birkat Hamazon. So the truth is, you know, Birkat Hamazon is more stringent. Why? Because it's from the Torah. But the other blessings are from the rabbis. Uh, and even though it's Birkat Hamazon, still we say that you can pray when you're inebriated. You can, you can do, you can say it. That's why, right? The famous halacha is that, you know, when you when you have your seuda for Purim, so don't, even though you're quite, uh, you know, well. You drank pretty good there, right? Um, you can still say Birkat uh, you know, uh, after the meal. Because um, uh, why is that? Because uh, it's not it's not tefillah, it's, it's bracha. It's only Birkat It's not Tefillah is more stringent than Birkat Hamazon. Okay, so uh, goes on to say here. He brings the Yerushalmi. It says, it says Kedita Yerushalmi. Like it says in Yerushalmi, Ve'achalta ve'sabarta. Right, you should eat and be satiated. The pasuk says. Right, so he says, even if he's like half asleep, you know, kind of like dozing off, still he can say Birkat Hamazon. So Birkat Hamazon is a different animal. Don't compare one to the other, right? It's a different, different Bria. It's a, it's a different, different creation. You can't compare that to prayers. Okay, good. So then it goes on. It says, furthermore, Tosfot. But he says, you know what? When it comes to urine, for sure, you don't have to pray again. As we said, right? Urine is from, only, only from the rabbis uh, in most cases. So, uh, even if you tell me, he says, um, that we're gonna we're gonna equate uh, blessings um, and prayers when it comes to excrement, Tanya but uh, when it comes to urine, lo hamire it's not as stringent as uh, excrement. 
דהא אמינן בסוף פרק מי שמתו, because we say right at the uh, end of this פרק, לא אסרה תורה אלא כנגד עמוד בלבד. As we said yesterday, right, that when it comes to urine, the Torah only forbids when it's like streaming out of your body. Ha-nafu'l yara, once it falls to the ground, share, it's allowed. Rabbanan hu de gazru behu, and the rabbis are the ones that go, were goes are there. They decreed about that. Din haya kore, so now he brings another issue, right? What about if he was reading right? What happens if you started to read and all of a sudden, you know, you see that you have excrement there in front of you. You didn't, uh, you didn't catch it. It says, it says the two wrote about this in Pei Aleph in chapter 81. So we'll get there later on pretty soon. Uh, so that's the story there, yeah. So that's the end of the Bet Yosef. So we're going to see the uh, Shukhanuch, and we're done with this chapter. Okay. I'm in the wrong place. One second. So it says the Shulchan Ruch, if he read Kiyachima in a place where it's doubtful there, there, there could be their uh, right, uh, excrement there. And then he found actually afterwards, he found that it was there. So his suspicions were right, uh, affirmed. Uh, so what do you got to do? You got to read, read it again. You know, uh, because you should have been careful. You should have checked before you started. Because uh, why? You were in a place where it could be that there is there. So why did you start to read without checking first? So therefore, we penalize you. And we tell you, read it again. Ah, but he says, if it was a place where there's, there, there's no doubt in places like this, why would you have excrement there, right? For instance, you know, like, why would you have excrement in your living room? What, is there a reason for you for that to, for, for it to be there? Right? Uh, if there is, I don't want to come to your house, right? Don't invite me over to your house. So <laughs> I'll stay home. Thank you very much. So, you know, then that's already something else. You, you don't expect it to be there. You know what I mean? So there, if you read it, what happens over there? Right, uh, so there, and you don't have to read it again. Why? Because here, there's nothing to punish you for. Right, uh, it was unexpected, you know, unexpected surprise. So <laughs> that's the way it goes. Yeah. Okay. So then it goes on to the third halacha, which is what? And what about urine? Even if he found it in a place where it's likely to be there. Now we just pick and say You don't have to go back and read it again. Why is that? As we said, right, that urine is only from the rabbis. So the rabbis were not so stringent about that. So therefore they let you off the hook. So you don't have to go back and read it again. There's a general, you know, famous rule, right, in the Talmud. You know what it says, right? Gzera agzera la gazrinan. You know what that means? We don't make one decree on top of another. You know, there's no reason to make two decrees. 
So what does that mean? If we would tell you in the case of urine, in the case of doubt, right, that you should go and read it again, that will be already two decrees. Why? Because the rabbis already decreed one time. They said when it comes to urine, you know, you have to be careful about that. You have to watch out. Uh, the Torah doesn't require you to be careful about that. So now if they would tell you to read it again, there will be another decree on, 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 you know, on top. Icing on the cake, right? And that already, you know, we usually don't have things like that. The rabbis don't make one decree on top of another. So this is the reason why, uh, right, uh, we, don't, we, we wouldn't have that. But there are exceptions to this rule, by the way. I'll give you an example. For, exa for example, if you ever learn the laws of uh, meat and milk, right, for instance. So what's this, what goes on over there, right? There are so many decrees there. Because according to the Torah, the only prohibition is when you uh, write uh, uh, the, the, the uh, meat and milk is cooked together. And the milk is... Um, the meat is like uh, like uh, red meat not that foul and the rabbis added all kinds of decrees right to that they said oh well okay well even if it's not cooked together don't eat it together that's one decree right even if it's not cooked together and also if it's foul as well don't eat it together even though the Torah doesn't require that so decree number two right then they told you also, you got to wait six hours, right, after the meat to eat the, the dairy. That's decree number three. So didn't I just tell you, wait a second, right? Didn't we just say, we don't make a decree on top of the decree? So then how do they make so many decrees when it comes to meat and milk? It's repeated in the Torah three times, is it? Yeah, it says three times, you know, this, right? It says, Lot right? Gedi, uh, immo. That's what it says, right? But, you know, so how does the, since it says it three times, <laughs> right, so since it says it three times, so therefore the rabbi, the rabbis explain it like this, that we're talking about if either it was, uh, right, if it was cooked together, you can't eat it, you can't cook it, and also you can't get any benefit from it. Okay, that, that I understand. Th th those are the three, three times that are written there. But all these things which I mentioned are, are additional, you know what I mean? These, these, the rabbis made them. This is not for the Torah. So why so many uh, decrees, right, when it comes to meat and milk? It seems like it's far-fetched. You know what I mean? So what's the answer to that, that question? Sometimes, you know, the, the Talmud answers like this, right, in these cases. The Talmud says it's one complex decree that they made. It wasn't a decree on top of a decree. So what does that mean? They made one big decree, you know, like a nuclear, you know, bomb, you know? They put it down on you, boof. A very big decree they made, but it was one decree, but it was complex. So the question is, why do they need to do that? Uh, and the answer is because the, the severity of the prohibition of meat and milk is very severe. It's a very severe prohibition. So when it comes to very severe prohibitions, sometimes the rabbis may make multiple decrees. But what does that mean? It's not really multiple. It's just like one complex decree in one shot. That's what we're talking about. So uh, yeah, that's the story uh, when it comes to that issue. So here also, right? I'm sorry, yeah. Kabbalah Tavav, I'm sorry. I have a question in regards to these um, different decrees. This complex decree, would, could this be compared to also the fence around the fence to avoid violating that one prohibition, that big, big prohibition? Right, so that's the thing, you know, that the truth is you're not supposed to make a fence around the fence, right? One fence is enough. Yeah, but here it's like one big fence, you know, with, with like barbed wire, you know, and uh, right uh, uh, spikes, you know, all kinds of stuff, right? Uh, it's one big nasty fence, okay. like they want, like the one they made, you know, near Mexico over there, right, to keep the Mexicans out. 
No offense, out. Esther. No offense. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm not trying to keep you out. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. So, uh, there you go, right? That's the story. Okay. So, we'll go, we'll go to the next chapter. We, we love Mexicans. We have no problem with Mexicans. Okay. The truth is, you know, that in America, there was many famous people who were Mexican, and the, the people didn't, didn't even know they were Mexican. Very famous people, you know, like very uh, respected people. People had no idea that they're Mexican. They changed their names. You know, they, they get, took like waspy names, you know, all kinds of things. A lot, a lot of people are Mexican in America. It's a big, it's a big uh, pool of people here in America. The last name Smith is, is actually... Oh, it's oh. Garza, actually. Oh, wow. oh really? <laughs> oh, is that true? Okay, I got it. I got it. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to start mentioning any names now, but uh, you know, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah. So it's one big, uh, big bad, big bad wall, right? All kinds of components. Sometimes the rabbis make the decrees like very big like that, very large. Okay, very good. So let's go to next chapter, which is Ein Zayn, I think. Yeah, Ein Zayn. 77. Okay. There's also a, a vibrant Jewish community in Mexico, I must tell you. Uh, with a lot of yeshivot and kolels and all kinds of stuff going on there. Mexico is a, is a big Jewish community there. You'd be surprised. Okay. Seventy-seven. So it says there like this, right? Um, uh, now we're going to continue with the issue of urine, right? Uh, this chapter is talking about urine. Right. So here's the thing: when it comes to urine, you can't read, uh, right? Uh, when, when there's urine in front of you, the same place there. Until what? Uh, until you put in there, revi'it mine. You have to add like a revi'it of water, three ounces of water. If you add three ounces of water into it, it dilutes it. So that's good enough. So why do I care if it dilutes it? Because it doesn't smell anymore so bad. The smell is not going to be so bad. So once you water it down, dilute it, that makes it okay. That's one way to do it. Um, okay, so the as muta loshna al gabkaka or bekli bilbad. So it says, doesn't make any difference. He says whether it's on the ground or it's in a kli in utensil. Same thing applies there. Shelo ye avit hamiuchad lehem, but bilbad shelo ye avit hamiuchad lehem. But it can't be something which is designated for that purpose of holding urine, right? So what does that mean? In those days, right, what they had is, they had like a special canister, you know, which was made for, for holding urine, right, or excrement, whatever. So that canister, what they would do is, once it got filled up, they would take it out and, you know, remove it from the house, dump it outside. Uh, so you have a canister like that, which is made for urine. So then we say that... Um, Right, uh, it's not going to help you to add water to it because that canister is like inherently dirty because it's always holding urine. It's like very smelly, you know, very, uh, right? Uh, so it's not going to help you.
Okay, so um, Rosh Hashanah you had the Kli Tehila and ten Ma'im Alein. Doesn't matter whether right, they were in the Kli and then they added water, or Rosh Hashanah you Ma'im Bekli, or it doesn't matter whether the water was there and they you know then they added urine to it. Either way, right? Whichever came first, it still works. This this solution. That's what he says. Katabam Arambam says the Rambam, he says, Rizal, Rabbi Eat Lamir Leaglain shall palm a hard, beam him your dirt, your sif mine to be a shoe. Ah, look what he says, right? So the Rambam gives you a ratio here, right? Rambam likes to do ratios, by the way. So uh, he gives us a lot of ratios. Uh, it's very helpful, these things that he gives us. But particularly here, what is he saying in the Rambam? He says that. When we said in the Gemara, you have to add one uh, revi'it, three ounces, right, to dilute it, that's talking about for, for one urination, right? In other words, one time, person urinated one time. That's going to be enough. But if it's more than that, so you've you got to add more, right, according to, the, according to the ratio, right? Each urination needs another three ounces of water. That's what he's saying. Okay, that's the end of the tour, right? It's a short chapter. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna gross you guys out too much with this stuff, but actually it's very helpful to learn this stuff, you know. Uh, very important to know these things. Because as we said, right, it applies to many things, not only Kriyachama, it applies to prayers, it applies to right to, you know, all kinds of blessings, as we said, right? All kinds of stuff. So you gotta be careful, you know, when it comes to these things. Make sure you're you're, you're also when you're learning Torah, same thing, you know. You have to learn in a clean place. So, you know, you can't learn in a place which is smelly. Smells like urine there or smells like excrement. As it says in the Pasuk, right? What does that mean? Right? Your encampment should be holy. You know, holy people have to have a holy encampment. That's the way it is. Okay, good. So let's go to Bet Yosef. Says Bet Yosef, right? The Sopek Mishemeto. Where is the source for this? Right? Take a guess, right? It's again, same place. Brachot. Chav Bet Amud Bet. All these things over here that we're talking about, they're all in Brachot. Masachet Brachot. Tanan, says over in Mishnah, Veloit Kaseb and Maim Haraim. That a person cannot cover himself with bad water, right? Meaning what? The smelly water. Velo be me Mishra, ad shiatil letochan Maim. Until you add water to it, right? So the only the way to fix smelly water is to add add water to it to dilute it when parash begin ma explains the gemara like this kafe amud bet hachi kama this one means to say lo be maim haraim ve lo be be mi misha klal umer aglaim ad shatil letochan maim so in other words he's telling you when it comes to urine you got to put you got to add water to it that's the only solution ve ka so there's a machloket, right? A dispute in the Braita. How much water do you need to add to fix this problem? Tanakama, the first opinion says even the slightest amount is good enough. Rabbi Zakai Amar, Rabbi It. Rabbi Zakai says no, Rabbi It, right? Which is three ounces, as we said. So Rabbi Yosef tells him, so you see from here, right, that Rabbi Yosef Paskind, like the second opinion, right, which is what? That we need at least a Revi'it of water, which is three ounces, as we said. Or in the metric measures, right, it's 80 cc's, right, uh, about 80, something like that. 
more or less. Okay, so um, that's also how much we drink, right? For Pesach, you know, all these things, Revi eat, right? Everything is Revi eat when it comes to drinking, right? How much you have to drink, Revi eat. Three ounces, right? All the things are Revi eat. Many of the measures that we have. Okay, so. Um, Then he goes on, It doesn't really matter if it's on the ground or in, in a clean utensil. So it says it's, 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 it's obvious, right? Says Bet Yosef. Also that which he, he wrote, that it shouldn't be something which is designated for urine, right? A canister made for urine. Right? King Katav Rashba, that's what Rashba says also. So it's also obvious. The Abit Afilu and Bo Miraglaim Asu. Why? Look what he says, right? That these canisters, you know, which are made for urine, even if there's no urine in them, it's still forbidden. Why? Because the smell is still there, you know, it's always there, it gets absorbed into it. But the question is, by the way, what kind of canister are we talking about here? In other words, what is it made out of? So if I'm not mistaken, right, we're not talking here about a metal one. Like, you know, we have, today our canisters are made out of metal, you know, whatever, many, many times. Uh, here, it's probably talking about something different a little bit. Uh, you, you know why I say that? Because metal, it doesn't really so much absorb, you know, the, uh, the urine, you know? So because of that, it could be that when you wash it, it's okay. Um, there's also, by the way, uh, when it comes to this issue, there's also a big question about this when it comes to our toilets. You know, excuse my, um, don't get disgusted. I'm sorry to just, you know, talk about toilets, but what can we do with halacha? We have to talk about it, you know. That's the way life is, right? So uh, halacha covers everything. No matter which room you go into, halacha follows you everywhere you go, right? The bedroom, the bathroom, the kitchen, there's halachot everywhere. That's the way it is. Not like some, you know, Jews who think, you know, that halakha doesn't apply in certain places, you know. Uh, let me do what I want, you know. When I, in the bedroom, there's no halakhot. Let me do what I feel like. No, you can't. In the bedroom also there's halakhot. Don't, don't think that there's no halakhot, right? That's why, you know, before you get married, what happens is, you know, that if, if a good rabbi will marry you, Right? He's going to first give you a couple of lessons about how to do the halachot, you know, of marriage properly. Otherwise, how are you going to know what to do when you get married? You're going to make a big mess, you know, like that, right? So the rabbi should teach you, right? That should be a part of the package. He's got to teach you how to, how to live with your husband, how to do all these things, you know? Uh, this is a part of love life. You got to, got to learn about it, right? I'll tell you something funny, you know? Don't take it the wrong way, what I'm saying, by the way. But, uh, you know, there, there are stories like this in the Gemara. True stories. That, uh, you know, there were certain, like, disciples, you know, of big rabbis, you know, like Rabbi Akiva. People like this. Can you imagine? You know, so what they used to do is these uh, Talmudim, you know, disciples that they had, these disciples were very, uh, very brave boys, you know, like, very, very brave. They, they weren't scared of nothing. So what they would do is, can you imagine? This is written like this, that when, you know, when these big rabbis, you know, would sleep with their wives in the bedroom, they would go creep under the bed, you know, these, these, this, and, and see, and listen to what they're doing in bed with his wife. Why? Because they wanted to know what's the halacha. So, <laughs> so what happened, <laughs> can you imagine? So they would, you know, and then they would come out of the, you know, come out of the woodwork, you know, on the bottom there, and the rabbi would say, hey, what are you doing over there, you know? I'm sleeping with my wife, and you're you're under the bed. And they would tell the rabbi, "Yeah, rabbi, I need to learn the halacha. I'm sorry, I had to I had to be under your bed." <laughs> it's a true story. <laughs> so when it comes to halacha, you know, you have to sometimes you got to be a little bit arrogant, you know. You got to learn the halacha. Sometimes you have to get a push. <laughs> Don't, don't, that's why it says in Pirkei Avot, right? You know what that means? A person who's, who's bashful, he can't learn Torah. 
You know why? Because he's too embarrassed to ask questions. Why are you so embarrassed to ask the rabbi a question, right? Go under his bed and see what he's doing, right? What's, what's the problem? What, what uh, you know? Or at least ask him a question. You know? Don't be afraid to ask. No, I can't talk to my rabbi about those things. That's dirty stuff. No, it's not dirty. This is life. You, gotta, uh, you know, it's dirty when you do against the halakha. When you do with the halakha, it's not dirty. It's clean. It's holy. You know, so you shouldn't think like that, by the way. That's a big, big mistake. Anyway, getting back to what we said, right? I diverted a little bit, uh, but, uh, right? So here also, this is the thing that, uh, right? Halakha is, as we said, you got to put three ounces of water in there to dilute it. Uh, <clears throat> So when it comes to the utensil, though, you know, this, this canister, it's not going to help, you know, to, to wash it or whatever, or to empty it. It's still smelly. Um, okay, so. Um, right, uh, okay. Okay. And that what she said that we don't really care whether you know the urine came first or the water came first. It's all the same. Right? They said in the Gemara there, the machloket the dispute is about what basof in, in the end. But when it comes to the beginning, call call even a little bit you can put. That's good enough. Rav Yosef Amar, but Rav Yosef says no. Machloket betchila, but basof tivi akol The the dispute is only about the beginning. But when it comes to the end, you all, everybody agrees you have to put Rabit. You have to put uh, right the three ounces. So it says, right, that these two rabbis, the Rif and the Rosh, Paskin like Rabbi Yosef, the Ben Betchila, Ben Besof, Shuran Rabbiit. Because whether in the beginning or in the end, right, either way, it's always the size of three ounces. So what is that begin, beginning and end? What is that talking about? As we said, right, we're talking about which came first, right, the water or the urine. It doesn't make any difference. It's all the same. Either way, you need uh, right, three ounces. That's the way it seems to be the opinion of who? The Rambam, right? So they all seem to agree, right, all the Rishonim here, that uh, that's Talakha. So what does that mean? You need a Revi in, in every case, no matter what. And also the Rashba as well. So there you go, right? Everybody agrees. Nothing to talk about here. Okay, so let's see the Shulchan Aruch. Okay, let's see what's going on there. You also cannot read Kiachama when there's urine there, right, in your presence. Unless you add three ounces of water, as we said, then it's allowed, no problem. <coughs> doesn't really matter whether the urine is on the ground or it's in a utensil. But we don't, if it's a canister made for that, for urine, that's a different story, right? That can never get clean, as we said. <clears throat> and he goes on, Lo shana hayu hem mine. Or also the order doesn't matter, right? Whether the, the water came first or the urine came first. Lo shana hayu it's all the same, right? Either way, we do require three ounces of uh, right water for each um, for each urination. Okay, that's the story there. Let's go to Bet. One, one more. <clears throat> so it says in Bet, let's do the Bet Yosef here. Uh, as we said, right, that Rambam says that for each urination, you need you need three ounces. Where is that coming from? Bet Gimel Milchot Kiyachima. It's over there, third pair of Kiyachima. Katav, 
uh, he wrote Bazil Shano, this language. Natan Revit Maim the Toch Miraglaim. If you put Revit of water, three ounces in uh, in urine, shall palm achad, one urination. Mutali kot gimahem, then you can read. Uh Dal Damot to within four amot. Umashma midbarab. So it says implies from his words, Shaim Hen Miraglaim. Uh, so implies from his words that if if a person if there's two urinations there, right enough water for two, uh, enough urine for two, so then you need three times three three ounces two times right six ounces for each time you need three ounces. If it's three, then you need three also, right three three servings right three portions. That's what it says in the Rosh Shahud Dat Rambam. So the Rosh says that's the way the Rambam holds. Zal. And it says, since he brought the opinion of the Rambam, the Rosh, but he didn't argue with it. So it implies that he holds like that. But the Rashba says, Right? Uh, so it's right? So the Rashba says differently, right? Even if you had a lot of urine in there, like three ounces will do the job either way. Right? Um, so it's a similar, resembles like the the uh, small amount that the Tanaka first opinion said. Rabbi Zakai, Rabbi Eat, Gainu, Damar, Le, Rabbi Yosef, and this is what Rabbi Yosef told his attendant. Ayli, Rabbi Yata, Demaya, so he says, but the halacha is not like that. So what, is that, what does that mean? Even though the Rashba here doesn't, it doesn't agree with them and says that, what? That even from much urine, you can use three ounces, right? Even if it was like a ton of, ton of stuff there. Right? Three ounces will do the job. But he says the halacha is not like that. Halacha is like the Rambam and the Rosh, who say that for every urination, you require, <clears throat> uh, you do require, right, uh, three ounces for each one. Okay, good. Uh, so just as a side side note, by the way, here, right? Uh, rabbis love talking about this stuff. So I'll tell you what I what I'll tell you, right? That the side note is like this. We already mentioned to you guys, you know, like uh, on a couple of occasions that, you know, uh, the Rambam is like, you know, according to Maran, he's like the biggest of the Rishonim, you know, the number one Posek, you know, Posek number one. Uh, well, the truth is, you know, there's also other places where he writes, he praises the Rashba a lot, you know, that he's like, all, like you know, as if number one. You would think that's what he thinks, that's what he's saying, you know? So here's, here's an example, right? The Rambam against the Rashba. So here he goes like the Rambam against the Rashba. So the truth is, you know, that uh, it's pretty clear from, if you, if you learn a bit yourself, you know, uh, for a while, you'll see that the Rambam has a higher status than the Rashba, even, even the Rashba. Even though the Rashba is a big, is a big, uh, has a big status, but the Rambam has even a higher status when it comes to... Uh, in the opinion of Maran Bet Yosef, right? So Maran Bet Yosef holds that Rambam is number one. And then Rashba is number two, you know? Like something like that. Whatever whatever you want to say. But the truth is, you know, that I could even be wrong when I say that because the top three, right? The, the big three, you know, where he weighs two out of three is the Rambam and the Rosh and uh, the, uh, the Rif. So it could be that the truth is that those those three those you know are have more have more weight than the Rashba each one of them, you know. So, uh, but you know, so I guess we have to say that you know those top three have the biggest weight for you know in the Bet Yosef. But uh, if if they didn't express their opinion, you know, and then you just have the Rashba against other opinions. So there, the Rashba has, the, you know, has the precedence over the other ones, over the other Rishonim. So yeah, it's pretty much right. So uh, it's something like that, right? More or less. Uh, that's that's the way it goes. 
because there are places where Maran says, you know, about the Rashba, he says, for me, he says, the opinion of the Rashba is like the majority of the Rishonim, you know, it's like, he's the majority, you know, so uh, just one person, but his opinion is so uh, strong, so weighty, that it's like the Rova Rishonim, it's like the, the majority, that's what he says. Okay, whatever, right? But here we see that he favors the Rambam. And the truth is, it's not only in this case, I've also seen other cases where he favors the Rambam over the Rajba. Okay, especially when the Rosh is also with him, obviously, right? That's even more. So here the Rosh is with him. So it's like two out of three, you know? As we said, Rif, Rosh, Rambam, two out of three. So here we got two out of three. Okay, pretty much that's, that's pretty clear. Uh, so then he goes on, the Siman... Pay bet katav rabenu. Over there says the uh, chapter eighty two says the tour. Kama yu niblaim be karka amir aglaim ve yeh mutali kol kishma kinegna. Right. That's also an important thing. Right. He writes over there different halacha, which is that when a person urinates, right. Let's say any you know, and it, it it's goes into the dirt. This happens very often, right? When a person goes, you know, uh, uh, on vacation or something, right. So he'll be in the field somewhere, you know, and he has to go, and there's no bathroom there. So what does he do? You know, it goes into, goes behind the tree, you know, and uh, urinates over there, right? It's very common in, in the woods. Uh, so the question is like this: that when you urinate into the into the dirt, right? Then how long do you have to wait until the urine gets absorbed into the ground and it's kosher to to read there? So he talks about that over there, right? In the chapter 82. We're going to get that. Right, That's also a different discussion. So what does that mean? That once the dirt, the, the general rule is like this, right? Once the urine gets absorbed into the dirt, it's considered to be like it's not there anymore, you know? So it's, you can read them. That's what he's talking about here. So the question is, how long does that take, right? For that to happen. Okay, very good. So uh, we'll see the uh, Shulchan Uch here. So says Shulchan Uch, Revi'it Shamru, right, Lemir Aglaim Shil Pam Echad. So as we said, right, the Rambam said what? That when they said Revi'it, to, to add three ounces of water, or 80 cc's, as we said, right? Metric. When does that work? For one urination, right? Uh, according to Rambam. That's how, that's how you use Shulchan Ruch Paskins. But if it was two times, right? So then you need six ounces, right? Double. You got to have double the amount of water. And also three, three, right? So in other words, for each subsequent urination, you need three ounces more water. And says the Ramah, the Chen Leolam, that's the way it goes, right? It's always proportional. Right? Not like the other opinion we saw, right? Which is the Rashba, who said that, no, you can even you can even do a lot of you and you could add three ounces. That's going to work it out. But uh, we don't pass it like that. So we go like the Rambam and the Rosh, who say, no, you need, for each urination, you need three ounces. Okay, very good. Uh, so we're done with this chapter. Can you imagine? All right, so we're going along good here. Let's see what else we got. We got a couple more minutes. Maybe we can get something done. But this one is also short. Okay, so let's see what's going on here. Ein Chet, 78. We're almost finished with the Shema. So it says like this, the tour, it's very short. This is, this is an interesting case, right? That let's say he was reading Kriyat Shema, and all of a sudden, you know, he starts to like urinate, like, you know, out of control. In other words, it's like dripping down him. You know, his thigh, right? Urine is dripping down his thigh. Some people can't control it, by the way, you know? You know there are people like this, right? They can't control. They need to wear, like, diapers, you know, sometimes. Because they can't control the urination. 
uh, especially older people, you know, senior citizens, they have this problem. And it's, it's very common with them. Uh, so if a case like that happens, like, so what should you do? Stop reading, right? If you see that happening, that it's dripping down your thigh, the urine, you got to stop until the, it stops, you stop urinating. And then once it stops, you can keep reading. Even though now your clothing is wet, you know, from the urine. It's okay. But he says, if he waited, you know, if he stopped long enough to finish the whole Kiyat Shema, he needs to start from the beginning. It's not enough just to continue where you left off. If not so, if he didn't wait that long, so then he just goes back to where he, you know, stopped and continues from there. That's the whole tour. Okay, so let's see the size of the Bet Yosef. And then we can see if we can finish it today. Okay, let's see the size. So it says Bet Yosef. Oh. Yeah, it's actually pretty big. So I guess we'll save this for the next time. Okay, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do it next time. Okay, Chazak Baruch, thanks for coming. Be blessed as well. Health, happiness. See you tomorrow. And be holy and happy and stay clean. Stay away from all this bad stuff, the smelly stuff. Keep yourself clean. Keep your house clean. And uh, right, keep your soul clean. That's the most important thing. Amen, amen. Thank you, Rabbi. All the best. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. God bless.